I was invited, I thought, or at least it was a, it was a, a, a nice coincidence that this is the centennial year of the birth of Blessed Jose Maria. And so there are celebrations in different parts of the world for this. There was a conference in Rome, which Dr. Haas attended in January. We had a beautiful big mass that some of you may have attended in Washington at the Basilica of the National Shrine with the Nuncio. And in a sense, these are preparations for that solemn moment of the canonization, which will occur sometime this year. We'll find out on Tuesday when the ordinary consistory of cardinals in, meets in Rome with the Holy Father and they announce the dates of these uh, special canonizations this year, Blessed Padre Pio, Blessed Juan Diego, and Blessed Jose Maria. And it's also true, and I, uh, you, you realize it more and more as uh, time goes on, what an incredible uh, experience <clears throat> it is to have known a saint. I think there aren't many people outside of Opus Dei uh, who have, well, in this present pontificate there are a few, but who have lived in a certain uh, even relationship of intimacy with a canonized saint. The process takes so long that usually mm, people have, have died. And, uh, but mm, in the case of Blessed Rosemary, following the norms that had been adopted about speeding up the process of canonization, then it has occurred more rapidly than ordinarily is the case. But it is an extraordinary gift to have known a saint. Uh, I was and, and not only have known him, but to have known him personally uh, and to have had regular contact with him and in a special way also to have been called to the priesthood by him and uh, have given him the blessing of a new priest. Uh, some of you, though, probably know about Blessed Jose Maria and have read books on him by people who knew him and came to know Opus Dei through him. But I'd like to speak from another slightly different perspective, that is, that of one who first encountered the message of Blessed Jose Maria, and then met the institution that he founded to transmit that message, and then met the messenger. Usually it's the other way around, the books that have been written. But I suppose what I'm saying is what will occur for all future time, when most people, anyone joining Opus Dei today or meeting the messenger, will not meet the messenger until we're united in heaven. St. Thomas says that whatever is received is received according to the mode of the recipient. And, for example, when a bird sings in the springtime, Another bird of the same species and opposite sex hears a mating song. A man who has worked or drunk all night hears a bird making a racket keeping him from sleeping. <laughs> and another man or woman with a musical ear hears a beautiful melody that becomes the New World Symphony. The same warbling of the bird is differently received according to the dispositions of the one who hears it. And it is with this in mind that I, I want to suggest some ways in which God prepared me to be receptive to the message of holiness that Blessed Jose Maria was sent to proclaim in a very particular way. My father uh, was not a Catholic. He was an Episcopalian, in fact, but my mother was, and I was baptized a few days after my birth. I attended public schools and received my religious instruction at Sunday school, which ceased in the eighth grade. For high school, my parents sent me to one of those prestigious New England prep schools called Deerfield Academy which was located in the next town over from where I was born and grew up. I didn't go as a boarding student, we couldn't have afforded that, but as a day student, 
a concession that the academy made to small numbers of people from the surrounding area. In my junior year, I read a book in a history class that made a great impression on me. Its author was Arnold Toynbee, and his book, a little thin book, not his long study of history, was entitled Civilization on Trial. As a matter of fact, I had the librarian in the school. I, now I'm the chaplain at the Heights School in Washington, and I had the librarian get a used book copy of that, and I reread it just two weeks ago. In it, the author summarized some of the ideas that he expanded on in his work on the study of history. But the basic theme is that Christian civilization, excuse me, Western civilization, the Judeo-Christian, Greco-Roman civilization of which we are a part, is in a state of crisis. He also presented, surprisingly enough, and I think later somewhat repudiated, the thesis that only a revitalized Christianity in its Catholic form is capable of enlivening a worldwide civilization that is irresistibly coming into being. This was 50, 60 years before globalization. This was many years before John Paul II's new evangelization. But these ideas, which I was exposed to in my junior year in high school, sort of embedded themselves in the back of my mind and continued on in my years at Harvard. In 1950, I enrolled in Harvard College and found myself drawn to a small group of Catholic students from Harvard and Radcliffe who were attempting to live their faith and see their studies from a Catholic perspective. A number of the young men, upon graduation, went off to become monks. One is presently the prior of Portsmouth Abbey. Another was the president of St. John's University in Collegeville. He's now deceased. Another, others became, well, another is, is now still today a, a monk of St. Joseph Abbey in Spencer, Massachusetts, one of the prime examples of Cistercian Trappist monasticism. Others became diocesan priests, such as Bernard Law. I instead took another way out and went to law school. And it was while I was attending law school that I came upon a book of points for meditation by a Spanish priest called Jose Maria Escriva. And the book was The Way. And several points immediately made a deep impression on me. The first one is 301, which I, people say I'm getting old and I keep repeating myself, but I've been doing it for nearly 50 years. <laughs> So practice makes perfect. I'll tell you a secret, an open secret. These world crises are crises of saints. God wants a handful of men of his own, of his very own, is a, another translation, in every human activity. And then Pax Christi in Regno Christi, the peace of Christ in the kingdom of Christ. And that point, when I read it, in the light of what I had read by Toynbee and also an essay by Berdayev and uh, some studies by a Harvard classmate of mine's father by the name of Petrim Sorokin. That is, all of these things came into focus in a very Catholic way, in, in, all in reading this point in the way. And another was one that I, formerly, when human knowledge, science, was very limited, it seemed quite feasible for a single scholar to defend and vindicate our Catholic faith. Today, with the extension and the intensity of modern science, the apologists have to divide the work among themselves if they wish to defend the church scientifically in all fields. You cannot shirk 
this responsibility. The message of the way that holiness, that is, committed Christians are the answer to the world's ills, came across with, Dale, with, with great clarity to me at that time. And it still does. The message is not only one of holiness, and that was the key, but of a holiness lived by lay people in their secular occupations and social environment. That is, men and women of his own, of his very own, deeply immersed in his passion, death, and resurrection, who later I would hear Blessed, Blessed Jose Maria saying a phrase which is truly shocking. You must be another alte Christus, ipse Christus. That phrase, ipse Christus, is unique to the founder of Opus Dei in modern times and in the Western spirituality. But he said it, and he repeated it again and again. And it meant committed Christians, everyone, all the baptized. Well, this is, these ideas were reinforced in me by several young men who had come to belong to a Catholic institution called Opus Dei that the author of the book had founded. There was also a priest of that Opus Dei with them there in Boston, in Cambridge, who was the spiritual director of the local group. That is, it all fit together. The message of holiness and the institution in which that holiness or the striving for it was embodied, organized in order to, in order to form people in and in order to guide them in going out into the work and spreading into the world and spreading the message to others. Priest and layman, layman working together with priest in order to carry out a single apostolic mission. I had met the message and the institution and they made sense to me. And I saw that this was a calling from God to me and I joined myself with them in Opus Dei to dedicate my life to its apostolate of spreading the message of holiness in all sectors of society through my professional work. This was in while I was a student in Harvard Law School. I will say that at that moment, it is, I'm sure someday it will be written down in the history of Opus Dei in the United States, a truly unique moment because in the spring of that year uh, 1956 55 that school year 55 56 something like six or eight men students at harvard became members of opus day and all of them are still members of opus day a number of them are priests one of them is a priest in heaven who was the first director of the Catholic Information Center in Washington, D.C., who died early. Of, and it was an, an incredible moment. Uh, several years later, after graduating from law school, I was asked by the directors of Opus Dei to spend some years in Rome with other young men from different parts of the world studying philosophy and theology and getting some ecclesiastical doctorate. And also knowing, in the spirit of Opus Dei, that some, if not most, of the young men studying there would eventually be ordained to the priesthood if we wanted and if the, um, if the founder wanted. And it was then in Rome that I met Monsignor Scriva for the first time. I did not know what to expect. Um, but what I found was a dynamic man in his mid-fifties exuding paternal warmth with a great sense of humor and a unique combination of a breadth of vision and a concern for little things. He repeatedly told us to dream, 
and that we would fall short. Dream of the ways in which God will use you to serve him and his mission of redemption that continues to be carried out in the world. At the same time, he always insisted that these big things were made up of little things, which must be done with human perfection for the love of God and as a means of co-redemption, with total detachment from whether they are a brilliant or a, a humble nature and whether they bring about instant success or do not. Because it is all in doing the will of God, in big things and little things, and seeking only the glory of God and the reward that God gives for those who are his good and faithful servants, and not pursuing any human ambitions. He was actively involved in the spiritual formation that we received in the spirit of Opus Dei, and that we understood would be necessary for us to carry out Opus Dei's apostolate in all parts of the world to which we might be sent. Now, having said that, having the message, the institution, and the man, the messenger, I'll go on to a few anecdotes, a few specific points of my years in Rome with Blessed Jose Maria and then later in Spain where I saw him frequently. Shortly after I was introduced to Monsignor Scriva, he began to call me his American colleague, colega, because he had studied law and so was I, had I. That is, we were both, in the broad sense of the word, lawyers. And from time to time, in the informal group conversations that we regularly had with him, he would look over the faces of the people who were there, looking for someone he recognized, somebody he might want to say something to. And sometimes he would say, where is my American colleague? Come here, sit down, and sit at his side. It was a sign of his affection, his warmth, and also of that, that great sense that he had, I'm dealing with people from another culture, a, a different society from mine, different language, I have to show them a special affection. And one of his uh, expressions of not necessarily special affection, but he would sometimes say to us Americans, there were quite a few of us there at that time, uh, that uh, you, 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 have to, you have to love one another. And he, he would give us a big, a big abrazo in the Spanish fashion or Mexican fashion and saying, you know, quereros, love one another, don't be afraid. And, 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 and he said, you know, and he, you know, most Americans would go like that. <laughs> <laughs> so that was part of the learn to relax, you know, enjoy one another. And he would speak to me one, on one occasion when I was sitting at his side and one of these out get-togethers, actually we were outdoors in a little patio, and he spoke to me about the importance of the natural law as the foundation of all just civil laws and of the need to do research and publish studies and a journal in this area in order to counteract the influence of the all pervasive schools of legal positivism, which he had been exposed to when he was studying law in the university in Spain, and that many of the others were also lawyers from different countries uh, and uh, the United States. And it made a lot of sense to me, and I knew at the time and even more today, that is, he was opening horizons. I mean, giving me, he was, as always, making suggestions, sowing seeds, and he knew that the freedom of individuals and the grace of God would determine where these seeds would be led, blown, and where they would sink roots and perhaps someday bring forth fruits. He was always sowing seeds. At that time, I was studying canon law. I arrived there to do the studies of philosophy and theology and also to get, a, get a, uh, an ecclesiastical doctorate. 
And so, at the same time, during the days, I attended one of the pontifical universities, the Angelicum, to study canon law. And in the afternoons and evenings, we studied philosophy. And during the second year of my studies, being a bright Harvard graduate, I decided uh, to write a, uh, a, a paper on an aspect of the canonical figure of the Secular Institute, which Opus Dei was at that time. And the man for whom I was writing the paper was a consultant to the Congregation of Religious and Secular Institutes, and he presumably knew all about it. So I decided to tell him what he should know. <laughs> there was a divergence of opinions on some aspect of the topic, although I cannot now recall what it was. And I wrote a brilliant paper, what I thought was a brilliant paper. But I gave it to Monsignor Scriva to read, and uh, when it came back, it had a lot of red ink and a lot of suggestions and a final do it over again. <laughs> but I was amused that you know this, this greenhorn American who's only been in Opus Dei a few years, who has no sense of, of the depth of its spirit, would have the audacity to write a paper on this topic and the founder didn't kick me out the window. Hmm? No, no, he just made corrections, made suggestions and said, do it over again. And I did it over again and the second time it went around and went out and it was handed to the professor. Well, I mean, to me that was, that was his way of acting. He, his way to, to, to make corrections and to send you on your way, accompany you with his prayers and this was the way that you were going to find, you were going to discover what is the way to do the will of God. During that period of time, uh, Blessed Jose Maria on a couple of occasions spoke to us about, about, oh, I need it's on the back side of this piece of paper. <laughs> <laughs> As the studies of canon law were uh, developing and coming to a close, and therefore my time in Rome with him, I, one day the two of us were sitting together in a, a little hallway in a little uh, reception area. He was waiting for someone to come to see him. And I said, well, I, I would take advantage of that time to suggest to him that I'd like to stay a little bit longer in Rome. And with a smile, he, he, he said, you know, our vocation in Opus Dei is to work. <laughs> Not to study, but to study in order to work. Now you finish your study, so you should have to go to work. <laughs> and we're, we're supposed to support ourselves with our professional work, so you have to support yourself. And we're not supposed to be cooped up in one place, a lot of us like this, but out in the middle of the world, working and doing apostolate. And he said, we'll see what happens. And a few weeks, a few weeks later, in, one, in a larger get together, he, he remarked that he and the other directors were planning to set up an institute of canon law at this little seed of a university that he had planted in Spain in 1952. At that time it was called the Estudio General de Navarra, which was really a glorified uh, a private academy, that is, where people studied arts and letters or law and took their examinations in the State University of Saragossa. But in Monsignor Scriva's mind it was going to become a great university, and indeed it has. And at that time, he thought it would be interesting to have an ecclesiastical faculty, which might rattle the cage of the Generalissimo, <laughs> and uh, provide the incipient university with a little bit more of a platform to seek its recognition as a full-fledged university. So I uh, thought this was a great idea. He said the institute would grant degrees through the Lateran University in Rome. And at the end of the get-together, he grabbed me by the arm, as he'd done on other occasions, and said, uh, would you like to go there to teach? 
So he had in mind what I was to do to work and support myself. He said, while you're there in Spain, you can continue your studies of theology, and if it's God's will, be ordained. In the meantime, do a lot of apostolate. Well, that's what happened to me. That as I went from Rome to Spain, because he sent me there, in effect, with my cooperation saying yes. And I remember on another occasion, I'll read another point from the way, which he had commented on to us one day, and I think the, the, the flavor of it will ring, have, will have some resonance in your ears. Duke in altum, put out into the deep, Cast aside the pessimism that makes a coward of you. Et laxati retia vestra in capturam, and lower your nets for a catch. Don't you see that as Peter said, in nomine tuo laxaborete, at your word I will lower the net, and you will say, Jesus, in your name I will seek souls. Now, if you have read John Paul II's apostolic exhortation tertio millennio in unte it begins off with duke in altum and it ends with duke in altum <clears throat> it's the same sense of the vastness of the mission of jesus christ and that the whole church and each one of us individually as the church have been sent into the world to carry out well that was what Blessed Jose Maria was saying to me. There were a number of other points, and then I, I have to go back and forth. My own experience, my own uh, encounter with Blessed Jose Maria, and the things which which he which he spoke to us about. One was where he himself had begun, ways, instruments for making present the apostate of Opus Dei and in a visible way and providing for a, a, a way to reach more people. He had begun with residences for students at secular universities. That was the way he began in Spain, in Madrid, Valencia, Saragossa, Barcelona, and Seville, and every provincial capital of Spain in the years between 1939 and 1947, when he went to Rome to live permanently, a student residence was established. When the first members went to another country, the first thing they did was set up a student residence. In Boston, it was Trimont House. In Chicago, at the University of Chicago, uh, Woodlawn Residence. Uh, in Cambridge, at Harvard, Elmbrook. That is, this was a, a way of being in touch and being visibly in a place. I mention this because in one of our get-togethers, you see, it was a wonderful and incredible learning experience that I can look back on now after all these years, and it's more, it's richer to me today than it was 45 years ago, among other things because he spoke in Spanish and I wasn't always sure that I understood what he was saying. But he was reading to us from the law of Opus Dei, as they were called in that time, the constitutions. And he said, here's the section about apostolates. You have, you have to put it in, he said. I was forced to put it in. And so here's a list. He said, but that's not the aim of Opus Dei. We, excuse me, we do those things, but they're not the end. And so it said, residences. And then it says, colegios, schools. Well, when he was saying that, there was one school that had been started in 1951 in Bilbao, Spain. When I went to Spain in 1959, it was still there. But a group of people from Barcelona were trying to start another school. And they did, three or four years later. And then we heard rumblings of some people who wanted to start a school in Madrid. 
Well, that summer, Blessed Jose Maria came through. And there was a get together with married members, supernumerary members of Opus Dei, men, uh, perhaps 50 or 100 of them. And, 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 and he said, well, you know, you've been starting a couple of schools. That's nice. He said, but I would, I was telling the counselor, the head of Opus Dei, that, that you people, you supernumerary, should have a school in every provincial capital of Spain within the next five years. <laughs> and they did. And he said, and not just one for boys, but one for boys and one for girls, separate. And they no sooner got the schools started, the first schools were sort of like, um, were seven through 12. He said, but go down to, 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 the, to the first grade also. So they become first through 12. And that was, became an experience that was spread all over the world in his lifetime and continues to happen in many parts of the world. It was a, his, the, 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 the spontaneity and the challenge with which he presented things was incredible. He spoke about universities. He said, we're not, we're not about universities, but there could be a few, maybe one in each country. In larger countries, perhaps two that people of Opus Dei could start. At that time, it was just Pamplona, which was not yet even, well, it was just barely a university. It had just been erected as a, as a university. Shortly thereafter, I think it was the people in Peru, up in the mountains, in Pura, started the university. The people in Mexico started. Now there are more than a dozen of them in different parts of the world. Because of that vision and that impulse that mm, empuje in Spanish that mm, Blessed Jose Maria gave to everything. An important part was hospitals. He wanted every university to have a medical school and a teaching hospital because of the connection between, between Christian charity, professional work, and theological sophistication in the developing field of medical science and medical treatment. This has become a reality. In Spain, he said, a lot of the people are poor. Farm schools, why don't you start schools and to teach the peasants how to live, improve their, their living? They did. In the area in Madrid, where he had been stoned by communists in the 1930s, he asked the people to set up a technical school, a vocational school, we would say, in the United States, to help raise the educational and social level of the poor people who had meant, been easy prey to the communist agitators in the 1930s. That happened, and it's happened in many other countries. The year that I went to Spain, in 1959, and to start the Institute of Canon Law, one of the first teachers there. It was a pontifical faculty. The year I left in 1964, they started the Faculty of Theology. A few years after that, the Faculty of Philosophy. And thus, the three ecclesiastical faculties connected to the University of Navarre became a reality. After Monsignor Escriva's death, a few years, ten years later, I believe it was, the, curiously enough, the, the pontifical faculty of canon law of the University of Navarre started a school in Rome. It's the first time that's ever been done. To start something in some other country related to Rome that way, but started, and that became what is today the pontifical university of the Holy Cross, run by the people of Opus Dei, which managed the conference back in February. It is, I have lived through the development of these works have seen, in a certain sense, the prophecy of Blessed Jose Maria and the guidance that he gave to all of these growth, this growth. And what has been incredible has been the growth of Opus Dei in his lifetime. When I joined Opus Dei, shortly after its 25th anniversary, we were studying we had to study Latin. I was in doing classics, had done classics at Harvard 
so it wasn't too bad, but some of the others hadn't. And we had a booklet which was published in Rome in 1953 for the 25th anniversary of Opus. It was all in Latin, and that was what we used for our Latin classes with letters from prefects of congregations and praising Blessed Jose Maria and praising the work of formation in no other institution in the church put such importance on the formation of its members for carrying out the apostolic work and this lay people engaged in all human activities. And therefore one would have the sense it was all done. But as Blessed Jose Maria would say to us, no, no, it's not all done, don't get the idea it's all done. Está todo por hacer. It is all yet to be done, and that's your job. I'm not going to be around here forever. You have to carry it out, because there's a whole world that is waiting. Our apostate is like a sea without shores. One of the things he spoke about, and I was saying, in, for the United States, was uh, one of the great things that he spoke to us of it was his great love for Our Lady. And out of his love for Our Lady and gratitude to her for her intervention in the growth of Opus Dei and in his own growth in the spiritual life, that we, that Opus Dei would sponsor a couple of, a few, algunos, some shrines to Our Lady in different parts of the world. So the first one will be in Torre Ciudad. Some of you may have been there to that shrine of Torre Ciudad, which he actively directed the creation of and was completed in just a few days after his death. It's a beautiful big shrine. The second one, he said, in the United States, somewhere. You will do it. It has not yet been done, but it will be done. And he would often say to us a phrase which he had written in 1935. I contemplate the work of God as God intended it to be, spreading over the centuries, leaving a broad and deep and fruitful furrow in the history of mankind. But it's necessary to wait. We have to be patient because God's work is done at God's pace by his grace and by our generous cooperation. It will be because he wants it. And these years have been the opportunity to see that become a reality. And I think that it is that reality that continues to be carried out in the life of the church. I'll go back to where I began, these world crises, whether it's the crisis of, of September 11th, whether it is the crisis of globalization, whatever, the crisis of the family, so many crises that sensitive people, good Christians are aware of. And yet today and tomorrow, as 75 years ago, the answer is the same. These crises are crises of saints. God wants <clears throat> a handful of men and of women of his very own, striving for holiness in the midst of their professional work, whatever occupation they may be engaged, in their family life and their social environment. In that way, we will provide the salt and the light and the leaven for that new civilization, that new culture that God in his providence is going to bring into reality. And that's more or less what I wanted to say. <laughs>